Good afternoon, everyone. Hi, I'm Liz Kruger, State Senator for the 28th District. And I think you know that you're on my se virtual senior resource fair session about nature and the environment. I want to welcome you all who are joining by Zoom and or Facebook. This is the third and final day of a three-part virtual senior resource fair. We all miss being able to get together in one place. We used to do the basement of Temple Emmanuel. Uh, they were so wonderful to us, but we frankly don't think the time calls for putting 800 people together in one room. As always, we have closed captioning for today's event online, and as a viewer, you have to activate your closed captioning to view the text on your device. If you're in Zoom, click on the live transcript in the meeting controls to start viewing closed captioning. And if you're on the Facebook Live version, you will see a setting button in the bottom right-hand corner of the video that says CC. Click on the CC for closed caption to activate the process. This forum is being recorded and everyone who RSVP'd will receive an email with links to all three recordings from my virtual senior resource fair sessions this year and the resources that are posted in the chat along with the presenters powerpoint it could take about a week for us to get them to you because we have to put together three events but again don't feel like you've got to be scribbling madly with a pencil every piece of information we gave you because it's all going to be made available to you afterwards before we begin this afternoon's program i again need to talk to you about COVID. As you may have heard, we are experiencing a new COVID-19 wave, and it's a new version of COVID. So even though this wave is not as severe in illness as other waves in the past, it is causing a number of coronavirus infections and hospitalizations to increase. To help avoiding contracting COVID, you may want to take precautionary measures, such as finding those masks you still have all over your apartment, wearing them in public interlocations and around large groups of people. This is also an important time to get vaccinated against COVID-19, the flu, and RSV. You can get vaccinated in participating pharmacies, doctor's offices, and health centers, and we will put up in chat information about how to find those locations. There are three kinds of the COVID-19 vaccine that have been approved by the FDA and the CDC. The Moderna version, the Novavax version, and the Pfizer version. They're all updated, different from the COVID vaccines we got in previous years, and they're all apparently equally um, effective. There is no data at this point in time that says one vaccine is better than the other. It's just really smart health policy for us, particularly as we get older or have any kind of respiratory illnesses, that we get these vaccines. And then we're going to move on to today's event. Today's Senior Resource Fair is, again, the last of three sessions and will focus on nature and the environment. I had a few older New Yorkers say, why is this for older New Yorkers? And I answered, what's happening on the planet, what's happening and available to us to learn more and participate in nature has no timeline on it. It has no date or age where it's suddenly not relevant. You're alive, you're breathing, nature and the environment matter. And of course, your children and your grandchildren matter. So you have to watch out for these issues for the next generations as well. New Yorkers witnessed a midday dark and orange sky um, earlier this summer, or really was in June. We saw our transit system come to a standstill after torrential rains, and we read about temperatures reaching 126 degrees in part of the country. We know our planet is experiencing the impact of climate change in many ways. Yet many of us feel helpless in the face of extreme climate conditions but we can all take actions to save our planet. We must also begin to realize that we all have to take care of and appreciate our urban environment. Just because we live in a big city doesn't mean what's happening in the planet or in forests or on oceans doesn't impact us here. Of course it does. 
Today, our speakers will share information about what we can do as older adults to take advantage of New York's urban parks and natural environment and work toward a greener planet. Our first speaker is going to be Christina Delfico, the executive director of I Dig to Learn, who will remind us that New York City is filled with natural treasures and show us some of the ways we can enjoy nature and how we can be stewards of New York's urban environment. After Christina, we will hear from Richard Santangelo and Leanne Darcy about bird watching in New York City parks and other Autobahn New York programs. Richard and Leanne are part of Autobahn New York's youth education program. Following them, we will hear from urban ranger, Carly Scheinberg, who will share information about the wonderful work walking tours you can take in parts in parks all over the city. And in big and small ways, all of us can contribute. One important action we can take is to eliminate unnecessary items from our solid waste stream through composting. Annalise Zausner Manis at Big Use will explain that process. And then our final speaker is Monica Weiss, an educator from Third Act, an advocacy organization started by leading environmentalist Bill McKibben. A key part of the Third Act's mission is to involve older adults in the effort to advocate for a greener city and a greener planet. After the presentation, I will moderate questions that might come from you, the audience. Now it is my pleasure to start us off by introducing Christina Delfico. Good afternoon, Christina. Good afternoon. It's wonderful to see you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Kruger and team for spotlighting an obvious but often forgotten resource around us all, nature. Many of us pass by trees and parks in a state of what we call green blindness. That's to be unaware of the health benefits that open green space provides us. After all, artists and dancers, musicians are all inspired by nature. So why not us? My name is Christina Delfico, and I am the founder of I Dig to Learn. It's an honor to introduce I Dig to Learn's offerings and share some of our favorite nature resources. But before I get going, please visit I Dig to Learn's website, idigtolearn.org, to find out more about us. And feel free to email me at idigtolearn at gmail.com. And if you're on Instagram, you can find us there too, at I Dig to Learn. Today, I want to share with you our key focus, which is on nature and protecting it. We will spotlight two I Dig to Learn initiatives that you can get involved in. And I'll welcome you to Roosevelt Island in the middle of the East River and in Senator's District. I'm going to share a few of our nature friends that are other organizations which also invite and welcome you to get involved. I'm going to say nature for the next slide. Thank you. Um, a quick story that got us thinking in the middle of a career in media with Sesame Street, my best friend and I read an article about how to retire happy. And their advice was to start developing areas of interest or hobbies that you enjoy before your retirement and before your retirement age. And that way, those development, those networks, those friends will be in place when you retire. So you might say, for me, my journey was from furry monster puppets to plants. But whether you like lichen or are wild about whales or want to have fun with fungi, let's jump into I Dig to Learn's area of interest, plants and all the living things that depend on them. I hope this will give you some good ideas and make nature more accessible to you. Next slide, please. 
Um, we started I Dig to Learn in 2012 with plants for younger children, growing food gardens and supporting green roofs. But we soon learned that every age, the young and let's say young at heart, we all want to learn more. Uh, after uh, a long career with um, uh, Sesame, I also had an opportunity to look into ways to lower our waste footprint and work with New York City to reduce the television and film industry waste and also talk at the UN. So the, what I wanna tell you is that I dig to learn provides social connections to our natural world. And New York City is teeming with it. Our two key areas of um, of focus are nature together, exploring it, and then how to learn to protect our water, land, and air. Uh, and, and the way we do that is through workshops, events, expert-led experiences, and community in initiatives. Next slide, please. And when I say we, I mean partners. Here are some of our partners. So this is also a call to you to be our partner. If you want to team up, we do too. Next slide. Now on to nature. Whether you're sitting on a bench looking at water or trees and flowers, it is truly a boost to our spirits and proven to help our health. So I think that that is something we often forget in the city. Uh, our philosophy at I Dig to Learn, when we build experiences together uh, with our expertise in nature, we create a bond. And then we're more likely to care about each other and the world around us. Nature. So if you breathe, eat, or use medicine, thank a plant. Plants are relevant to our daily life. And a fun fact, I do this a lot. You can smell rosemary, the herb, and it is proven to sharpen cognitive function and refresh your brain. Try it, you'll like it. Nature, I'd like to invite you to Roosevelt Island. This is I Dig to Learn's home base. And here on this map, you will see from north to south, a couple of beautiful green spaces that are available to you. And you can get to Roosevelt Island, which is Manhattan, by the ferry, the tram, or the F train. Nature. The two initiatives that I Dig to Learn is focusing on right now, and you are invited. One is seeing the forest for the trees, and that is at Lighthouse Park on Roosevelt Island, the northernmost point. We have planted a hundred trees, thanks to many partners, and created a monarch butterfly corridor. Now I'm not asking you to plant a tree or dig a hole, but you can enjoy the beauty and participate in some of our upcoming forest side chats and expert led walks. So please do. Nature. Our other initiative is Bellies, Bins and Beauty. And that is a food initiative where we come together in groups of 35 to 50 to have a meal, learn how to use more of our food and get food into bellies, and then the scraps into bins for compost and then beautify our neighborhood flowers and trees with that compost. So this is a, 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 an umbrella initiative that has a lot of pieces that you can come to and be invited to. Nature. Quick slide on some of the books we're reading that you can check out on those cooler days that you might not feel like getting outside. Nature. And now I want to tell you about a few of our friends that also have resources for you. Grow NYC. They have workshops that are free, both in person and virtually, to get you engaged and find out what you like. Nature, the New York Working Pollinator Group, a relatively new group that celebrates butterflies and pollinators. And they have a beautiful website you can check out to learn more. 
they have events and they also teach us things like we didn't know that honeybees don't need saving learn more about wild native pollinators and their importance nature gotham wales okay look out state of maine this is really unbelievable new york city waterways have spotted through gotham wales initiative over a 300 humpback whales. Now you can go, you don't need to take a cruise. You can go on the New York Ferry and catch a partnership, which is either Sea Streak or American Princess. And for a couple of hours, literally see whales under the Veriz nearby the Verrazano Bridge between Sandy Hook and Coney Island. It's amazing. Nature. Carrie Russell, you may not know about Carrie Russell and Dendro Lab, which is all about trees. Often there are many free, there's an upcoming webinar, but there are many free webinars and very low cost walks. So check out Carrie Russell Dendro Lab NYC. Nature, NYC Ecoflora. This is a group who invites everyone to participate in observing and learning more about nature in New York City. They have a terrific website with past recordings that you can find out about and learn. And also you may um, you know, see their events. Nature, if you read the New York Times, you may have read about a uh, fungal fungus fair. Uh, the New York M Mycological Society has a New York City Mushroom Club. Everyone's invited. They're really excited to tell you more about that. Nature, Billion Oyster Project. So our waters are cleaner in part because of the Billion Oyster Project who are taking shells from restaurants, reseeding them, putting them into our waterways, to strengthen our coastline and the side effect is cleaner water, which means the bunker fish are back and we've had dolphins spotted in the East River. It's amazing. Next slide. Trees New York has a citizens pruner course, very popular. So you definitely wanna get on there and try to register uh, as soon as you can. That teaches people uh, about pruning street trees and it's a lot of fun. Next slide. And lastly, uh, New York City Parks, you're going to hear more about that. Uh, Green Thumb, they have a list of all the community gardens near you. Find out where they are. There are often free events in parks, but these community gardeners really do want you to visit, talk to them, and it's just a beautiful excuse to get outside see some flowers and learn about nature at your own pace. Last slide. I just wanna thank you, the Senator, everyone on this panel and all who helped it be possible to highlight nature. It really is accessible for all and I hope you learned some more. Please stay in touch and connected. And now it is my absolute pleasure to introduce another partner, uh, Richard Santangelo and Leanne Darcy from Audubon, New York, a state program of the National Audubon Society. Thank you, Christina. What a great presentation and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and thank you to Senator Kruger for inviting us to this panel. Um, it's an honor to, to, to present um, along with so many great organizations here today. Um, my name is Richard Santangelo and I am the program manager uh, for Audubon New York's youth education programs here in New York City. Um, I'm co-hosting today with our program coordinator, Leanne Darcy, uh, who will be talking about some of the volunteer opportunities um, our education programs have to offer. So uh, like I mentioned, we are Audubon New York, an official state chapter or state program of the National Audubon Society. Um, as part of National Audubon, we protect birds in the places they need today and tomorrow throughout the Americas 
using science, advocacy, education, and on the ground conservation. Audubon state programs, nature centers, chapters, and partners have an unparalleled wingspan that reach millions of people each year and inform and inspire conservation action. So let's talk a little bit about birds. And I have a question up there for all of you. What's your favorite bird? I know that everyone has one. Um, every time I ask this question, I ask, you know, what's your favorite bird? Maybe it's a bird you saw today or this week or over the weekend, or maybe it's a bird you remember singing uh, when you were growing up. Um, everybody has a favorite bird. And, you know, birds are an important indicator species of the health of our environment. Uh, we know that where birds are thriving, people are also thriving, that the, the, the environment is healthy, the air is clean, the water is clean, um, and birds are definitely an indicator of a healthy environment. Um, there are over 400 species of birds that have been observed in New York City, including many rarities that are found by just passionate bird watchers, you know, like myself and just, just local everyday people who go bird watching in our larger parks and our smaller parks and just around our neighborhood, observing and, and, and uh, taking note of the birds that they see. Um, and, you know, each spring and each fall, in fact, right now, um, there are thousands of birds that are migrating through. They're moving from their, their summer homes, their nesting habitat, um, down to their winter homes in Central and South America and other places. And, you know, after a long day or night of flight, thousands of birds migrating over New York City, they, they search out green spaces um, to rest and refuel. Um, and that results in a dense concentration of birds um, in a very small and concentrated place. Um, and that makes New York City just one of the best places in the world to go bird watching. Um, and so that's just a, a really great and an awesome thing. And, you know, bird watching is, is one of the uh, most, uh, the fastest growing hobby, I believe there is at the moment. And you don't need much um, to do bird, to go bird watching. You don't even need a pair of binoculars to observe birds. Um, you know, birds are, you know, one of those animals that you are most likely to, to first encounter every time you walk outside of your home. And there are many places to go bird watching in New York City. Um, Central Park is probably the most famous place in the whole world to go bird watching. Uh, folks come from around the world just to come bird watching here in Central Park, uh, especially during spring and fall migration. But there are a lot of other small parks, little pocket parks, you know, parks with playgrounds, parks with community gardens that are also really great spaces um, for bird watching. Um, a couple of places on the Upper East Side here, St. Catharines Park or Carl Schertz Park on the Upper East Side as well. So you don't necessarily have to go to a large place or go uh, seek out a large uh, swath of woods or a large park or a nature preserve to go bird watching. Um, you can just, you know, go around your neighborhood and go bird watching. In fact, this is the probably the most common bird watching that I do is just our neighborhood bird walk. We do this uh, with our students as well in our education programs. Uh, we take them around the block, around their school, and we just see what's around and we get to know the nature around them, the, the local birds in their environment, in their community. Um, this is probably, you know, working in an office environment, this is probably the most common bird watching that I do, uh, birding from the window, uh, looking out for hawks and other birds passing by. Um, window birding is a great opportunity. A lot of folks will put a bird feeder outside their window um, or just, you know, observe their local birds um, and get to know them on a, on a deeper level. Um, you can also bird watch virtually. There are a lot of um, bird cams on the internet. Uh, Cornell Feeder Watch is one of the more popular bird cams. Um, this is probably up on my screen almost every day that I'm sitting at a computer. Um, you know, in addition to bird watching from my window, I'm bird watching virtually through the Cornell feeder watch. Um, this gives you an up close and personal sort of 
observation of birds. Um, and sometimes they're even identifying the birds for you. Um, there's also sound, so you can hear the birds singing and calling to each other. So bird, bird watching virtually is a great way to get to know um, local birds in your community as well. Um, so looking for birds, um, you know, when you're looking for birds in your neighborhood or in a New York City park, um, you want to pay attention to um, just the ground around you. Um, right now, a lot of birds like the white-throated sparrow are looking for insects and other invertebrates in the leaf litter um, as the leaves are falling onto the ground this fall. Um, so looking down just at your feet and you could find some really interesting birds. Again, this is something that you don't necessarily need binoculars to do. Um, these birds are generally uh, very up close and very accessible. Um, looking at eye level, um, just in the shrubs at eye level, you might see a gray catbird. They're a little bit more secretive. They like a little bit uh, more of a darker sort of habitat, but they're very accessible and easy to see. Or just look up, just look up, and you might see one of hundreds of raptors that um, nest on building and bridges here in New York City, um, like our resident red-tailed hawks. And these are just some of the local common birds that you can see almost every day um, throughout the entire year. Uh, bird watching is not just a spring or a summertime activity. Uh, many of these species, they stick around all winter long. Not all birds migrate. Uh, many birds like cardinals and morning doves um, and some of our woodpeckers um, and the blue jays, they don't migrate uh, long distances. They stay locally. So we get to enjoy them um, all throughout the season, even in the winter. So these are just some of our, our local birds, our common birds to get to know. And you know, I always recommend um, when you start out bird watching, um, get to know all of your local species, all of the birds in your backyard, get to know them really well, because then when you can uh, observe something different, you know it's a different species of bird because you know your local neighborhood birds so well. Um, some tools for bird watching. Uh, field guides are great. Um, I always recommend the small one. Uh, larger field guides have many, many pages. They can be very daunting. Um, so I always say just observe. Um, look at your field guide later. There's a lot of small fold out field guides like the ones that we use in our programs that fit nicely in our back pockets. Um, but also if you're into technology, um, you can just uh, download a field guide right on your phone or your tablet. And there are some great apps out there to help you identify birds. Merlin um, is probably my favorite app because you can just have the app listen for birds. And when it hears a bird calling, a bird singing, it'll identify that bird for you. It'll recognize the call and it'll identify the bird because a lot of bird watching is also listening. Um, we're using all of our observation skills. We're using our sight, we're using our hearing and a lot of birds um, we hear before we see. So Merlin is just one of those great apps. Um, Audubon has its own field guide. Um, online field guide and iNaturalist is another one that's very popular. You can take pictures of not only birds and other wildlife, but plants, um, mushrooms, anything that you want, and it'll go through sort of an ID key for you and help you identify what you're what you're seeing out there in nature. Um, and then lastly, uh, before I hand it over to Leanne to talk about how to volunteer with some of our programs and get to become more of an expert at birds and other wildlife. Um, there are so many organizations out there that um, host beginner bird walks. Um, there's our local chapter and partner, NYC Audubon, the Central Park Conservancy. There's the Brooklyn Bird Club. Uh, NYC Queer Birders is a smaller birding group that hosts bird walks. So basically just get out there and go birding with experts. And that's a great way to get to know birds, bird watching with the folks who are um, experts at identifying birds through sight and sound, and also know where to go to find birds. Um, that's most important because when you're talking about even more rare birds, um, these folks are gonna be able to take you to those places where you can see some of those rarer birds. Okay, 
And, you know, one more way to get involved in nature and birding is to volunteer for our education programs here in New York City. We run uh, an elementary school program called For the Birds, and I'm going to hand it over to Leanne. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Leanne Darcy, and I am Audubon New York's Senior Coordinator for Education and Volunteer Outreach. And I'm going to be giving you an overview of our For the Birds program, as well as our volunteer program. So Audubon New York's education programs focus on increasing people's knowledge and awareness about birds, other wildlife, and the natural world. And our flagship program, For the Birds, enhances traditional elementary curriculum and provides foundational skills and knowledge in bird conservation. So during a four, eight, or 12 session program, program participants learn about birds and local habitats in their neighborhood through both in-class and outdoor lessons. And each program culminates into a field trip to a local park and or a habitat project that's designed to attract birds and other wildlife into the community. And so this program is a huge undertaking and it would not be possible without the help of our volunteers and our interns. So this is where they come in. Our volunteers and interns serve as environmental educators with the For the Birds program. And they do everything from administering lessons about adaptation to New York City's pigeons to leading bird walks in Central Park. And serving as a volunteer and environmental educator is a really wonderful way to learn alongside students about the local environment. And of course, we wouldn't just throw our volunteers and educators and interns into the deep ends. We would provide you guys with training. And pictured here is an example of a volunteer training session at Central Park, where we gave an overview of how to lead a bird walk and walked participants through what a field trip and classroom lesson might look like with us. So once our volunteers go through tra training with us, they'll be ready for the classroom. And pictured here is a volunteer who'd been involved with For the Birds for over 10 years. On the left-hand side, she's conducting a lesson on dusting, and on the right-hand photo, she's conducting a lesson on migration. So this is just an example of how our volunteers can gain experience with teachers, children, and adults within the local community. And our program isn't just limited to classroom lessons or field trips. We also partner with a variety of organizations to host events outside of our traditional programming. So for example, pictured here is a volunteer event from the summer where volunteers traveled all the way to Coney Island to plant beach grass, thanks to a partnership with um, the New York City Parks Department. And here are more examples of outdoor programming that our volunteers can get involved in. At the top left, we partnered with PS75 or the Emily Dickinson School and the Westside Community Gardens for a scavenger hunt and native plant gardening day at the Westside Community Gardens with the students. Below that was a field trip to Astoria Park with PS85 where um, interns, educators, and volunteers were observing a flock of Canada geese that had just landed in the East River. And on the right-hand side, we have students observing a flock of pigeons during their Project Pigeon Watch lesson, which counted where they counted on the different color morphs that pigeons exhibit, and they monitored their behavior together. And to wrap everything up, we really wanted to showcase the entire scope of our programming to you all and provide you, provide you with a map of all the schools that we've worked with. And so, you know, to limit barriers to entry for our programming, we really do our best to travel to schools when we conduct our lessons in bird walks. So we'll go to them. And that has taken us all over the five boroughs, as you can see. So if you have any questions about our programming or becoming a For the Birds volunteer, please feel free to visit our website linked in the chat and on the screen or to email uh, Richard or myself. And uh, thank you guys for your time. I'm also happy to introduce Carly from the Urban Parks Rangers in Manhattan. Hey, thank you so much. Um, thank you to Leanne Richard from Audubon and Christina from IDIG. Those are both um, organizations that the Urban Park Rangers um, have worked with in the past. Um, uh, and very much aligned with what we're into. Um, so I'm gonna share my can everybody see it so um i'm an urban park no, ranger oh not yet okay one second you good yep we're good all right so 
like I said, my name is Carly. I'm an urban park ranger um, in Manhattan. There are urban park rangers all around the five boroughs. Um, we have several commands in each borough. Um, I'm located uh, mostly around Central Park, but we travel to all the parks, big and small, all throughout um, the borough of Manhattan. Um, and a lot of people um, don't have never heard of the urban park rangers before. A lot of people who have been going to these parks for, for many years say this is the first time I've seen you. Um, but uh, the urban park rangers have been around since 1979. Um, and we were a part of a program to help connect um, New Yorkers to nature, help keep parks um, a bit safer um, than they were leaning towards. So um, as urban park rangers, we do have um, three main responsibilities. Um, our probably most exciting uh, responsibility is the education portion. We are part of the public programs division of um, New York City Parks and Recreation. So we're not federal, we are, we are city-based, um, which is another confusion that people have. They think we're National Park Service. Um, but education is um, one of our um, largest assets. Um, we do, um, the, during the weekdays, we do programs for school groups. We call that the natural, natural classroom, um, where we cover topics um, that they would normally cover in school that range from like, botany um, to general ecology to Native American studies, um, geology, um, and, and different histories. Um, and those are generally for school groups, um, for elementary, middle, high school, and even college. Um, we do a bit of enforcement as well in the park. Um, I like to tell kids that we stop people from stealing squirrels and building tree houses, but we also um, make sure that people are safe in the park, that people are respecting um, boundaries of the park, of the wildlife, um, and of the other park patrons. So if you're in the park um, and you see a park ranger, and if you see um, you know, a condition going on, we are definitely people that you can flag down um, or you can reach out to 311 um, to report those conditions to. Um, and we'll make sure that um, those conditions get corrected. And another fun aspect of our job is that we do animal rescue um, within the parks. So we do focus on wildlife rescue. So your raccoons and opossums and even coyotes that you might find in New York City parks um, will be responsible for um, going and um, assessing those uh, kind of conditions um, and then deciding whether we need to trap and transport, if we're gonna re relocate um, and if we're gonna bring it to a rehabilitator. So we work with Wild Bird Fund, we work with um, the Animal Care Centers um, of New York and we also work with some um, individual um, rehabilitators for uh, birds like raptors which is kind of the first um, way that I kind of wanted to talk about getting involved, um, being, being really stewards of your environment um, within New York City Parks is, is through our animal conditions. Um, so these are mostly conditions that do get reported by park go goers. And we tend to have more um, animal conditions in the summer um, or in the warmer months because that's when more people are there. So we have, you know, all eyes on the parks. Um, uh, so some of our more interesting ones, I mean, they're all very interesting and they all come with their unique challenges. Um, here we have Ranger Nick with our uh, red-tailed hawk. Um, we often see red-tailed hawks uh, falling victim because they are um, predators of rodents. So they do fall victim to rodenticide often. Um, and our urban wildlife face a whole number of um, challenges live by virtue of living within a city. Um, sometimes people are feeding them the wrong things. So we have our mute swan here, which I'm not sure um, what the exact condition was for this photo, but often we have um, waterfowl that get a disease called angel wing um, because they get fed sort of the wrong um, foods, they get fed bread, which is really bad for them. It's nutritionally void and it'll cause them to develop um, uh, deformed feathers so they can't fly anymore. Um, so some of those conditions are a bit sad, but we also are a possum here. 
Um, I think this one was just one that woke up on Fifth Avenue um, and I had to remove it from just, you know, being in the middle of everything and I didn't really know where to go. So a lot of times we do just end up relocating animals um, to just a safer place within the park. Um, we do get domestics that people leave in the park. Um, so part of our outreach is really like we don't, you know, encourage people to leave their their old pets in the park. They're, you know, we encourage them to bring those to ACC, but we will do that transport if people fail to do that. Um, and so the way that kind of the, the public can get involved in this, um, and like I said, this is how we get most of our animal conditions is to take note of the location, the animal type, you know, a good guess as to what you're looking at um, is always fine. Um, sometimes we get called for to get an eagle and it's a seagull, um, but either way, that's always worth checking out. Um, and what you think might be wrong with the, the animal and then calling 311. Um, and 311 is absolutely, we get the reports from 311. Um, this is like our main reporting system. Uh, so it's very, it's very important asset for us. Um, and then kind of a more fun way to get involved um, with kind of what we do as park rangers. Um, our weekend adventures, we have um, public, free, um, accessible. It's, they're all meant to be um, family friendly, all ages um, and adaptable. Um, so if, there, if the hike has, uh, is slated for an hour and a half or two hours and you get 40 minutes through and you say, I'm tired, I wanna go home, no big deal. You're allowed to come and go. Um, but we do cover um, a wide range of topics as we do with the natural classroom um, that I mentioned before. Um, so I just wanted to share some of those highlights. Um, we have, um, this one was a tour of the birding on Broadway murals, um, which were a number of murals across um, Broadway um, that featured um, uh, like migratory birds or birds of concern. Um, we also recently had our Fort Clinton Central Park program. Um, we have a very deep history in Central Park, so um, we can. Those are those are always pretty fun. We have we have to separate them through like the north end or the the reservoir, or the south end of Central Park because there's there's so much in there. Um, so history is a big part of what we do, and and two um, of our larger programs um, are the Little Red Lighthouse program and the Hybrid Water Tower program. Um, the Little Red Lighthouse um, is quite popular because of the book, um, The Little Red Lighthouse and the Great Gray Bridge. Um, there is usually a, a Little Red Lighthouse festival. Um, and once we kind of sort out all of the refurbishing with the lighthouse, we'll, we hope to have it open more regularly. But um, from time to time, we do have um, tours. We'll let people go through. We share um, a bit of the, the history um, of the lighthouse. And likewise, um, with the Highbridge Water Tower, which was a feature of the original aqueduct that brought uh, New York City fresh water um, back in the 1800s. So these are kind of historical buildings that um, will open up and allow people to, to walk through um, to whatever ability you can. Some people see that the, the hybrid water tower has almost 180 steps in it. Um, we don't expect everybody to walk up 180 steps. So um, it's always you know, to whatever your abilities are. Um, like I said, we do Native American programming as well. Um, and, and also I just wanted to bear in mind that I'm a Manhattan based ranger. So a lot of what I'm gonna be talking about is in Manhattan. Um, there are tons of, there's tons of programming um, and other sites within the five boroughs or throughout the five boroughs. Um, but specifically um, one of our great Native American sites is Inwood Hill Park which is one of the oldest forests um, or the oldest forest in Manhattan. Um, and we have um, several stops throughout that forest that hold very deep history um, with the Lenape people, the first people um, of Manhattan. Um, so here I have featured the Lenape Caves, which are um, which is a rock formation that we have found evidence um, of use from many, many years ago, there were arrowheads and pottery found within these caves. 
Um, and at our nature center, which I'll talk about more in a little bit, we have our a wigwam, um, which was built by an indigenous person who is then it's overseen by an indigenous person. Um, and um, yeah, when the nature center is open, we can give tours of that as well. Um, nature exploration is kind of a larger um, topic. Um, Audubon spoke a lot about birding. We do a lot of the same things. We even work with Audubon um, in their uh, Christmas bird count. Um, we help um, host a program where um, New Yorkers go out into the parks and just count as many birds as they could see to help. Um, it's a bit of a citizen science. Um, you can help uh, monitor bird populations. Um, in this photo here, um, we were looking at a great horned owl. Um, it was actually, we have a resident great horned owl named Geraldine, but the one that was here um, in Central Park was a visiting male. And so everybody was very excited to, to watch the male and see if they were gonna interact with the resident owl, great horned owl that was a female. Um, it eventually left <laughs> um, with minor interactions, but um, that was a multi-day birding program that we continue to show up for. Um, and on the other side, we have Ranger Mara um, fearlessly leading um, some patrons through the snow um, by the Harlem Mirror. Um, so these are, again, general nature exploration hikes. Um, we usually just kind of go out into the woods when it's when it's this kind of topic, we go out and we see what the park is gonna give us in that day. and and it's always different. Sometimes there's a, a red-tailed hawk pulling apart a squirrel, or sometimes you see a really um, other rare bird species, um, or maybe snakes or something more interesting as well. So you never really know what the day is gonna give you. Um, we also hold family events and festivals. Um, so family camping is one of our very popular programs that runs on a lottery system that you have to apply for the lottery. And then the next week, at, by the end of the week, I believe they tell you um, if you've been accepted for the program. So we do um, a few throughout the summer. Um, it's usually families, um, lots of small kids, and um, we help you set up tents. We take you on a night hike. We do s'mores, we tell ghost stories, um, and the rangers will keep guard while you camp out in any of the Manhattan parks. So ones that we often do, we do Fort Tryon, um, we've done Inwood Hill Park, we've done lots of Central Park camping programs, um, which is fun. Um, and the last time I was on um, a Central Park camping program, we saw a coyote. So there is definitely a lot of cool, thing, cool things to see late at night. Um, some of our more nocturnal animals like bats. Um, and we also have several festivals throughout the year. Um, and those are large family oriented festivals, um, usually um, centered around like we have Raptor Fest here. So raptors uh, meaning birds of prey. Uh, this is uh, Ranger Sergeant Rob holding a Eurasian Eagle Owl. Um, this Raptor Fest is, is it's centered around learning um, and games um, about uh, birds of prey. And we'll have our um, Raptor Rehabilitator, um, Bobby, kind of come and, and bring some of his um, educational animals for um, the public to interact with. Um, other ones are uh, uh, Urban Wildlife Festival as well. Um, we also have the Senior Games, um, which are is a series of um, athletic games around the five boroughs. It, sort of becomes like a competition. So there's um, archery um, and other kinds of um, like competitive sports that you can, can enter. Um, and we also do a fair bit of community outreach as well. Um, so one of the programs that we've been trying to do a lot right now is our anti-feeding um, anti-raccoon feeding outreach. Um, we love raccoons. Um, they are native species in our parks, um, but we have a bit of a problem with people uh, feeding raccoons, which is not healthy for them. It gets them to gather um, and it, uh, like it encourages the spread of disease. Um, it's also not healthy for them, not healthy for us to interact with them. So we've been going out to Riverside Park um, at least twice a week to let people know um, 
that it's just not safe. And a lot of people do things and don't know what the consequences are of them. And once they know, you know, education is the best enforcement for us. Um, and I also just wanted to say that um, we will soon, our Inwood Hill Park Nature Center has been closed um, since Hurricane Sandy, Superstorm Sandy. Um, it suffered um, quite, quite the large amount of damages <laughs> during that time. Um, it's finally been rebuilt and should open early 2024. So that'll be a community hub that you'll be able to visit. Um, and just real quick before I end, I wanted to just share how you can find these free public events. Um, so I'm navigating to the website. Can everybody see that? Okay, no one's telling me no. So um, you can go to our New York City, nycgovparks.org, go to programs, um, and you choose urban park ranger programs, click on that. Um, and you'll be brought to this page and there are a lot of words on this page. You can just scroll down. So here you can click on any of these squares that sound interesting to you. So we're going, if you're interested in art and nature um, and you wanna see what art and nature based events are coming up, it'll give you this map, which will show you where it's gonna be. And it'll show you um, the date, the time and the location and a bit of information about that. And it'll pretty much always say free because all of our programming on the weekends is free. Um, otherwise you can just go to see, view all upcoming Urban Park Ranger events um, and scroll down and you'll just see for every borough what's going on. We have autumn nature crafts um, in Queens um, coming up, we have a doggy day hike um, at Cornelia uh, at Wolf's Pond Park in Staten Island, geology at Forest Park Visitor Center. So there's a plethora of um, events that you can attend all around the city, um, whatever works best for you. Um, so yeah, that's that's my presentation. Those are that's the Urban Park Rangers. Um, I'd like to now introduce um, Annalisa Zauser Manis, um, who's the Education Director for Big Reuse. Thank you, Carly. Um, hi, everyone. I hope you're having a great time. I'm learning so much, so I can only imagine. Um, I can't wait to go check out the Cornell Feeder Watch. Um, my name is Annalisa. As Carly said, I am representing Big Reuse. I'm going to be talking a bit about compost. Um, and I want to thank not only Senator Kruger, but Wendy coordinating this whole thing. And of course, Ian and Dana behind the scenes making it happen. Um, so again, composting. We're going to talk about what it is and kind of how it's it, what its purpose really is. Um, I have Julie Menon here. We are, I work with council members across Manhattan, Brooklyn, and Queens um, with the potential to spread into Bronx and Staten Island to do compost application and education. And I'll talk about that a little later. Um, so I am here thanks to um, Julie Menon, who is District 5's councilwoman. So uh, this is our kind of breakdown. We're going to talk about what compost is, why it even matters and where and how. And I think this is a hot topic right now. I'm more than happy to answer any questions possible. I, and my email is going to be given out to everyone. So really just email me. Um, I'm not gonna refer you to a website or an Instagram or anything. Just send me an email. I'm pretty good. I should respond within a day or two. And I'm happy um, in addition to what Senator Kruger's office is sending out, we should be set, um, help you find any resources that you might want or need. Um, so I'm not sure if you've heard of the word compost or not before. Some people use it as a verb. Some people use it as a noun. Um, so I'm going to start and just talk about it here as a verb. Um, so the natural process of recycling organic matter, such as leaves and food scraps, into a valuable fertilizer that can enrich soil and plants. So I made leaves brown to represent kind of the the carbon part of the process and food scraps green um, to represent the nitrogen. Compost is a mix. It's about a three to one ratio of carbon to nitrogen. I'm not gonna get too sciencey, um, but it is really exactly what it says, the natural process of recycling organic matter. You can see 
whoops, in this photo here, um, this is obviously not in New York City, this is upstate, but you can see a huge pile of compost in the process of being composting. You see a lot of organic matter. Um, unfortunately, it looks like some of this is food waste, which is very different than food scraps. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, but it is literally this process where we're turning piles. Big Reuse has two sites. We have one in Gowanus and one in Queens. In Gowanus, it's at the Salt Lot. And in Queens, it's under the Queensboro Bridge, where we actually do this. So we collect food scraps in those big green, they're called toters. You'll see them later. And we are turning food scraps and organics into fresh compost. And my team specifically is taking that finished compost, next slide, and applying it to street trees across the city. I know I'm getting ahead of myself, but bear with me. One important thing in the process of composting is to remove your stickers and your rubber bands and your twist ties. This is something that some of us, again, it's kind of like, I, I feel like, Audubon was saying this, I think it was Richard, you know, we don't even see them and they're right in front of us until we're looking for it. It's the same thing with stickers and rubber bands. Sometimes people just, we don't think to take it off, but in being conscious of the fact that this finished compost will end up as a soil amendment and trying to be conscious of keeping plastic, um, PFAS and, and like matter out of our soil, um, considering our soil is growing, organic matter, the cycle of life, just a nice thing to keep in mind. Um, another picture, again, not in the city, but upstate of a compost pile. Okay, so this is the act of composting, the, the verb. The second is what I've been talking about, the finished product, which is the compost, which I would say is a noun. And this is that natural rich fertilizer um, made from the recycled of organic material. So it kind of looks like dirt. Um, I get it. People call it dirt all the time, but it's not. Um, I think we know the difference between soil and a fertilizer, um, but this is compost. And again, it is completely natural. The fact that Big Reuse has our two sites, again, in Brooklyn and Queens, and we are collecting organic scraps from the city, turning it into this finished compost in the city, and then reapplying it in our public spaces with partners across the board is this, I mean, I, I feel very privileged to work with Big Reuse because it's such a closed and tight knit circle where we are reducing fossil fuels and we are keeping such a kind of circular economy of that food scrap and organic matter. Uh, it doesn't leave the city. And I think that's pretty remarkable in 2023 to have something that's all inclusive in the city. Uh, a close up of the organic matter. And I spoke about this before. Again, my team does compost application and education. We're funded through council members across the borough. We might be funded in your district. We do a lot of street tree care events because, again, going back to what Audubon said about looking at birds, seeing them right in front of you, these are our tree pits. And you can see that that soil is really compacted. Um, it's a huge, it's really sad because not only when it rains and we try to water it, there's runoff that that soil can't absorb water, but also there's no nourishment given. So our street tree care events, we're usually aerating, we're cleaning the beds, of course, getting rid of any kind of garbage, then aerating the soil using hand tools to actually loosen up that soil bed and applying our finished compost mixed with wood chips. So it's this sort of woven blanket that we put on top of the tree. Not only does it help, and it's an incredible amendment for uh, rainwater, so there's no runoff, it actually holds that moisture and feeds it to the tree. But our trees, we always talk about planting and we need, we definitely need more trees. Um, there's no question about it, but we also need to take care of the trees that we have. And that's something that, again, my team is doing thanks to funding from council members like Julie Menon in Manhattan's District 5 and across the city. Um, so this is the primary use, again, keeping that compost, keeping those organics in Manhattan. This is a picture, again, just a few pictures so you can have a visual where this is, obviously there's no tree there, but we are weeding, removing all of this. You see it's a green bag. We will be bringing it back and composting that. So again, closed knit, cl closed circle system. 
here we involve kids. I work with a lot of different schools, nonprofits, local organizations. It's really an education process of an, in of itself. And again, we're across all the boroughs. So if you're ever interested, you will have a link to see all of our updated um, events coming up. And of course, you can always email and I'm happy to share that again. Um, or, and if you are part of a group that really wants to take care of your street trees, call me. <laughs> we can make something happen. So this was a partnership with NYU up in, it was about 99th, 100th and Lex. We were up on the east side. And this is another one. I think you get the idea. But again, I mean, if you look at this tree bed compared to that first picture, it's a totally different story. And especially with our young trees that we're planting, we really need to care for them because street trees are not, they're kind of this no human land uh, where nobody does take care of them. So it's quite important. Um, we also do some education around it, and this is possibly one of my favorite pictures of my colleague Gil um, doing a workshop in, I think this was a library in Brooklyn, and his, this, the child's mother clicked this photo, and it just, talk about a thousand words, it's perfect. So compost. So that's what compost is. I talked a little bit, but I want to talk more about why and just give you some data. Um, this is the last EPA report. I heard there was a new one actually, so but I heard that literally two days ago, so I'm going to check. But in terms of MSW, which stands for Municipal Solid Waste, um, in 2018, the EPA reported that landfill in 2018, 24% of it was food. So that's my little emoji. That was my face when I saw that because um, it's really sad um, that there's so much food waste. Um, I'm a native New Yorker. I was raised by uh, my mom, was born and raised in Brooklyn, went to Hunter, moved to Manhattan. That was it. My father moved to America for my mother. So I was definitely raised with waste not, want not. Um, so I think that kind of comes into this for me. Um, when I looked at DSNY's website, I pulled this quote, which says that New Yorkers throw out 10,000 tons of garbage. Some quick math, 10,000 tons, that's a day, I'm sorry, one day. Um, 10,000 tons is 20, <laughs> yeah, 20 million pounds. It's insane. Um, 20 million pounds in New York City. And some quick math. So I took the 24.14% from EPA and applied that to the 20 million pounds. That means that food waste in New York, it's not a perfect number, right? But if we're estimating and using data, about 5 million pounds of food waste is, thrown, is found in New York daily. Um, so that's why. That's really why we're composting. That's why this is so important. Um, I, I think it speaks for itself. In terms of where and how, this, I'm gonna to try to keep as simple as possible. You may or may not have seen these green bins all around the city. Um, these are part of DSNY's outreach right now where they are collecting compost. This bin um, collects food scraps and food soiled paper and plant waste. Um, to be clear, they are all over the city. This map and this link will be sent to you. Um, so I can click here. I'm not sure what's going to happen. So I don't want to mess things up and I think we're over time. So I, the, the click, the link will lead to uh, this live, which would just, you can click on it and see exactly what corner it's on. You do need to have a smartphone to access the smart bins, hence why they're called smart bins. Um, but you can access them if you have a smart bin all over the city. This is specifically in Manhattan and Roosevelt Island. You can see it is important to note that there's a difference on the map between orange, again, linked back, oh, linked back to these bins, and green, which is linked to food scrap drop-offs. Now, why, you might ask. Again, you will receive articles on all of this, but the green bins, I'm sorry, the orange smart bins are being collected by sanitation and are being shipped or, or driven over to Newtown Creek. 
and turned into a sludge kind of material for anaerobic digestion, which is hopefully, hypothetically, going to be a partnership with um, our gas system to provide um, to provide energy. That being said, there is with anaerobic digestion still a methane release, and it's not a full capture, and it re requires a lot of infrastructure. So the orange bins do not produce that finished compost, even though I know it says compost. It's talking about the verb of turning it into something else, not the noun of that final product. So these smart bins are, and again, there's an article in Curbed Magazine that will be shared with all of you if you're interested in learning more. They are sent to anaerobic digestion, whereas the green food scrap drop-off pins, those are food scrap drop-off sites. They are managed by people like Big Reuse, Lower East Side Ecology Center, Grow NYC, different nonprofit environmental organizations across the city. I'm sorry for the 20 I did not mention that are collecting food scraps and processing it locally and turning it into that finished compost again that we started the presentation with. So it is important to know the difference between those um, so that you know what your where your food scraps are actually going. So um, that's that's the basics. This is very much compost 101. Um, some basic tips, uh, no animal products. Again, it's kind of thinking about what comes up from the ground, bringing it back, um, breaking up things. Citruses are particularly hard. Again, this is specifically if you're going to a food scrap drop off, um, trying to keep it as clean as possible. Because again, remember that pile, it's just sitting and being turned. There's very little energy put into it aside from sitting in the pile and turning it, carbon and nitrogen. So we're cutting up the citruses, breaking up corn cobs, um, loose tea, be conscious of your tea bags. A lot of them are or have plastic in the wrapping. Um, like I mentioned before, removing stickers, rubber bands and twist ties, um, using your brown bag or reusable container to bring it to the site. And in general, just consuming and sharing responsibly. There are community fridges all over the city. Um, mutual aid, I think, is stronger than ever in terms of just being able to share access to your resources and making sure that nothing is going to waste unnecessarily. Um, I want to thank you all for being here and um, thank you for your curiosity about this. It takes a lot to really do any of these things that we're talking about and composting. Um, I, I would give a shout out. My mom at 71 didn't know about it and started and was so compelled. She actually pays for a service to do it. So um, not that my mom is the perfect model, but it's pretty impressive. And I encourage everyone um, reach out with any questions. I'm more than happy to ask. Senator Kruger, I see you. Would you like thank to say you. something? Yeah, we have to move on to the next person. I'm sorry, Annalise. So of thank course, you so of much. course. I'm happy to introduce Monica Weiss of Third Act. Hi there. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll be mindful of my time here, but I just want to give a shout out to Annalise and composting because as I speak about what we can all do in our third act in retirement, um, my husband and I, who have been retired for a number of years, have been composting for about eight years now. So the very first thing he did when he retired from his professional career was to go to the uh, Botanical Gardens in Queens and take the master composting class. So we've been doing this for a long time, and it's a wonderful program, and it's a very responsible. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, very good. So it's a responsible way, you know, to, to live in New York City. Um, briefly, I'm going to talk a little bit about my own background, very briefly, and then I'm going to introduce you to Third Act, an organization that can help you engage uh, with activism in your retirement years, as we have. Um, I am a retired New York City public school teacher. I was an early childhood educator for over 20 years. And I have a master's in environmental education. And when I retired and I began to have time on my hands, um, I sort of began to focus my attention 
on climate and environment and nature. And when I realized that my excellent New York City teacher pension was invested in fossil fuels and that this in fact was driving climate change and the climate crisis, I joined 350 uh, NYC and I joined the divestment movement. This was the beginning of an awareness that how we invest our money impacts other things. And the very children that I had been working with and teaching for over 25 years um, and promising opportunity and future, we're going to have a very compromised future uh, if we continue to invest in fossil fuels. So my very first entry point into climate activism after retirement was to enter the divestment movement and promote the divestment of New York City pensions from fossil fuels. Uh, this took over six years and Scott Stringer was the controller, New York City controller at the time, but through a very sustained and targeted and strategic and relentless campaigns, uh, we actually impacted New York City's decision to divest their pensions from fossil fuels. And I, and I feel this was a very, very important move. Um, it helps us align what we do, which is teach children and enable um, productive citizens for the future with opportunities. And we are not reneging on that promise once we retire uh, and collect pensions from New York City. So. Moving forward, uh, in my early years of retirement, I took every opportunity to learn everything I could about climate, climate change, and I joined 350 NYC. I took Vice President Al Gore's climate reality training, and I became a climate reality leader uh, and doing presentations, uh, educational presentations to young people and adults as well. I learned about Drawdown Solutions Project, which is a very solutions oriented approach to how to battle climate change. And uh, subsequently in the last 18 months or so, I've joined with a wonderful, wonderful organization of elders called Third Act. Now you can pull up the Third Act website if you would. Yep, it's up. Okay, I don't see it, so I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not seeing it, so I don't know what to refer to here. Well, I'm not able to see it. I don't know why. Yeah, I'm not able to see the website. I can't speak to it. Here we go, very good. So third act, uh, if you wanna scroll down a little bit, has two primary goals. One is to save democracy and the other is to save the planet from the um, devastating impacts of climate change. And they do that in several ways by creating and building community of elders across the United States. The retired generation uh, uh, in this country holds about 70% of the personal wealth. We also have a lifetime of experience. We have skills, we have wisdom, and most of all, we have time. And the idea behind Third Act is to use that to the benefit of democracy and climate. There are campaigns to divest um, money and banks from fossil fuel investments. And everything we do in Third Act also includes youth. It's, a, it's an intergenerational um, effort and Everything we do, we do for them, essentially. We're doing to protect the world for future generations. We scroll down a little bit. Uh, there are several ways you can get involved. You can sign up and join a mailing list to find out what, what Third Act is doing. You can take action. There's a section to find out what kinds of actions and work Third Act is doing on a national level. You can find a working group, their affinity groups, for example, there is a New York City working group, which I belong to. There is a faith group, which people who are affiliated more strongly with their faith can join. There are educators groups. There are lawyers groups. 
Um, so there are different affiliations uh, that you can join depending upon where your interests are. And you can attend events. If you scroll down a little bit, there's several interesting events coming up. For those of you who are interested in just finding out more about Third Act, let's get started. There is a Zoom on October 30th, so that's coming up and very worthwhile if you want to learn more about what Third Act is doing. And the one on November 7th, Bridging the Divide with Dr. Catherine Hayhoe, I've also signed up for. Uh, Dr. Catherine Hayhoe is um, a climate scientist and an evangelical Christian who basically speaks to the importance of acknowledging the science of climate change and how to bridge the divide between the science and people's faith. So she's really a phenomenal speaker and a very inspiring scientist. Uh, highly recommend joining her Zoom if you're able to. And just take some time to explore the website. There are resources, there is information about how to write a letter to the editor or how to contact your legislators. And um, there's also a link to a New York City uh, working group. And I encourage people to join. And I hope to see some new people, some new faces on our next Zoom in New York City. So thank you so much for inviting me and um, moving along. Very much, mm -hmm. so appreciate it. So I confess we are running a little late, except everybody was so interesting that I wasn't concerned about that. And the fact is we really only have a couple of questions that have come in. Um, so one of them is for composting, uh, where the person asked, they thought putting weeds in compost piles led to weeds growing in applied compost. Do we know if that's true or not, Annalise? Happy to answer that. Senator Kruger. So depending, but there has been compost gets to a high enough temperature that most weeds are killed and they do not grow in the applied compost. There are a few, I think there's, it's like black walnut or something, but most weeds are actually remediated in the process of compost because of the heat. Great question. Thank you. And then our, I think our next and last question, um, which probably is for our urban ranger, but someone else might know as well. When I'm out in the, with my family in the park, it's always beautiful to see the mounted officers who sometimes let us pet the horses. Is there a way to find out when the horses on patrol are going to be any specific location? Is there a schedule for them? Yeah, so I'd be happy to answer that. Um, so they, the, the mounted officers are, uniformed on-duty officers. So um, they're not really giving out their schedule and their information just for safety um, and efficiency issues. Um, but they do, I know that Mounted does have a program called A Horse of Course, um, which is kind of, <clears throat> excuse me, um, an educational program that um, getting um, the public, and I think it's more focused with youth, um, to have um, to learn about um, you know, equestrian um, skills and getting closer to horses and stuff like that. And I think you can find those, um, the, the schedule for that on the New York City Parks website. But since the mounted, um, they're kind of like in a different um, section of the urban park service than we are because we're in, um, public programming and they're more focused in law enforcement. I don't have like the exact schedule for a horse of course programming. Thank you, Carly. So here's one last one that popped up. Does anyone, and everybody's welcome to turn their, turn their camera back on and the go on mute so just people can see you. Thank you. Um, does anyone know of any group working on what's called chatting benches here in New York City? I'm suspecting that's groups that sort of meet up at benches to chat with each other. Uh, does, does one of my staff know any more details about that question? You're welcome to join to help me out on that. Oh, I'm not sure that anybody knows. And none of you seem to know the term chatting benches. 
Well, certainly know when you will. Oh, hi, Wendy. Yes. So I, I just would ask Dana if she would. We had a group on for another event on solo aging, Carnegie Hill Village. Yes. I know they do yeah. walks in the park and they may know about that. So Dana, if you could um, put a link for Carnegie Hill Village in the, you know, just in the in the chat so that people have that information. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So now we've actually gotten to the part where I need to do my closing. So I want to thank their wonderful speakers, Christina. Richard and Leanne, Carly, Annalise, and Monica. Um, there was something for every one of us to learn. And I wanna remind everybody that we're holding our first live event since March, 2020. This coming Tuesday, Halloween night at Carnegie Hall from 6 to 8 p.m. I'll be talking about key policy and legislative issues coming up for the new legislative season. Uh, with special guests, um, crime, environment, housing. Uh, the RSVP link for this event is listed in the chat. Now, seating is limited, and we may already have a waiting list. So if you can, if you know you signed up, but you don't think you'll be able to come, if you let us know that so we can make sure to give your seats to somebody else on the waiting list. Again, I want to thank every one of my guests for participating. I'm going to start shouting out nature in between everything, just like Christina also. I really like that. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> and I want to thank my staff who put this all together. Um, Wendy, who's here on camera right now. Dawn, um, Dana and Ian, who are behind the scenes. Can't do it alone. It always takes a village. I wanna thank you all for joining in this afternoon. Remember, stay safe, get those vaccinations, mask up in indoor public spaces, spaces, and also they advise you wash your hands all the time. It actually prevents you from giving yourself the disease by transferring from some other connections you've been having. So again, thank you everyone for, for participating today and have a good rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Next